what, what was, I think, in a way most and continues to be most tragic for Hong Kong is that the government really has demonized and made enemies of the people who support the protesters and the protesters themselves. Indeed, Carrie Lam herself has described them as enemies of the people. And so the government has made an enemy of an entire generation of its youth and also the engine of a service-led economy, such as Hong Kong, the professional middle class. And it's it's obviously it's, it's against the, the economic self-interests of Hong Kong, but also it's just a tragedy for a government to divide its own community in that way and to treat the, the best and brightest of the community as enemies, effectively forcing them either to leave or, 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 or condemning them to a lifetime of being marginalized and, and feeling undervalued and, 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 and not, not an accepted part of their own society. June 16th, 2019, two million Hong Kongers came out in the streets in protest of the extradition bill, adding up to one of the largest protests in human history. In this episode, we'll talk about the lead up and aftermath of that day, discuss how protests grew increasingly discontent and violent, as well as the new national security law Beijing is imposing on Hong Kong. Throughout, we'll be comparing and contrasting the 2019 Hong Kong protests to America's Black Lives Matter street movements. With us to discuss is Anthony Dapparan, a lawyer and author of two books on Hong Kong protests. The first one, entitled City of Protest, was published in 20F17, and his most recent book, City of Fire, focused on the 2019 protests, and in multiple parts yesterday brought me to tears. Anthony, welcome to China Talk. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. So let's start at the umbrella movement. What is it? How did it raise hopes? And why were so many disillusions with its outcome? So the umbrella movement occurred in 2014. It began with a promise, uh, a promise of universal suffrage for the election of the chief executive, which is the equivalent of the, the post handover governor, the head of the head of the Hong Kong government. And Beijing had promised that in, in 2014, they would provide a, a model for, for Hong Kong to have universal suffrage for this election. Yet it quickly became apparent that what Beijing's idea of universal suffrage was, was very different from what Hong Kong's pro-democracy activists wanted for universal suffrage. And so the pro-democracy activists, led by a, a law professor from Hong Kong University called Benny Tai, uh, set up an organization called Occupy Central with Love and Peace. And they said that if Beijing's model for universal suffrage didn't meet their standards for, for free and fair and genuine open elections for the chief executive, they would uh, begin a civil disobedience movement uh, to occupy the central business district in Hong Kong. So sure enough, Beijing's model for what they called universal suffrage came out. It was very limited. It required that all the candidates be nominated by at least half of the members of a small circle nominating committee. It also provided that there would only be two or at most three candidates allowed to run in that election, Beijing saying that any more than that and, and voters would be confused. So in response, the, the activists said we're going to go ahead with our with our plan to, to occupy Central. In the lead up to that proposed protest, a number of student groups, including Scholarism, a group of high school students led by a young man called Joshua Wong, and uh, a federation of the city's university tertiary student unions called the Hong Kong Federation of Students, began a, a class boycott and some protests down by the, the government headquarters there. And when other people tried to, to join that protest and police tried to disperse those protesters using tear gas, that led to the, the occupation uh, that became the umbrella movement. Protesters came out in mainly three locations in the city, in, in, in Admiralty, outside the government headquarters, up in the, the Mong Kok commercial district in the north part of Kowloon, and also in the Causeway Bay uh, shopping district on Hong Kong Island. And they occupied the streets for um, more than 70 days. And the aim was that by occupying and blockading the city, by creating a level of inconvenience, they would be able to force the government to the table to negotiate and, and 
get the government to agree to offering a, a better model of, of universal suffrage. And so that was the aim. It was a very optimistic movement. They were, they were agitating for a, a more perfect form of democracy for Hong Kong. But ultimately, it ended in disappointment and disillusion, as you, as you alluded to. And there were a the, the, the couple of reasons for this. The, the, the first and the main reason was that the government completely refused to compromise. The government would not come to the table. The government just decided that they would sit the protesters out. And as the protests dragged on, as the weather turned colder and winterier, as the protests moved into December, and as people began to become exhausted and, and, and disillusioned, they, they gradually gave up hope. And then the government, with the use of the, the court system, obtaining some injunctions to, to clear the roads, eventually forced the protesters to disperse. And that was the end of the protest. So there was a, a great deal of disillusion that the protesters did not achieve their aims. But there was also some other secondary disillusions. And I'm, I'm going to mention them because they become relevant when we start to talk about uh, last year's protests. Uh, there was some disillusion among the, the leadership of those protests. So during the Umbrella Movement, there were very clear leaders. There was Joshua Wong and the other student leaders. There was Benny Tai and the other Occupy Central group leaders. And they very much directed proceedings from the main stage in the Admiralty occupied area. They were the ones that decided protest strategy, what would happen and, and when. And, and there was some disillusionment with the fact that these people were, were imposing themselves in some ways as leaders on the movement. And there's also some mm -hmm. disillusionment that there were different factions within the protesters. There were the primarily student protesters in Admiralty who were more, perhaps more moderate, more idealistic. And then there were the protesters from the Mongkok uh, occupied district, which were uh, much more radical, much more willing to engage in violent confrontation and had perhaps more extreme notions of, of, of what was appropriate protest and what their aims should be. And so that was some of the rumblings of discontent that was going on in the background of the Umbrella Movement when it finally uh, dissolved at the, at the end of 2014 without any concrete result. Okay, so take us take us up to 2019. So I think it's important before we talk about 2019 to talk about what happened in the intervening five years. So yeah. after the umbrella movement ended, the Hong Kong government began, backed by Beijing or encouraged by Beijing, began a steady crackdown on 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 various rights and freedoms in Hong Kong in different ways. So that was seen, for example, in the, the prosecution and jailing of the various umbrella movement leaders. It was seen in the aftermath of the Legislative Council elections in 2016, when some of the pro-democracy candidates who were victorious deliberately swore their oaths of office incorrectly as an act of protest when they were taking up their seats in the legislature. Beijing and, and the Hong Kong government used that as an excuse to then disqualify those those candidates from office. And so we had six duly elected pro-democracy legislators who were booted out of office, basically. The government had a number of other initiatives, all of which were gradually clamping down on the, 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 the civic space for, for the expression of dissent in Hong Kong. And all of this was met with not much of an outcry. There was the odd scattered protest, but there wasn't really any strong pushback from the pro-democracy camp. And I think in those intervening years, as Jasper Zhang, one of the veteran pro-Beijing politicians himself, has said, the, the pro-Beijing camp thought that they were winning a, a wonderful victory and they'd finally, having sort of forced the umbrella movement protesters to, to give up and go home, they'd won a, a, a what they thought was a permanent victory over the pro-democracy camp in in Hong Kong and were sort of congratulating themselves on how well they had done. And I think that, that call it hubris, was one of the things that fed into the way that Carrie Lam then approached the, the extradition bill in, in 2019. That's just an important piece of background to bear in mind. So Carrie Lam became chief executive in, in 2017, replacing the, the, the previous incumbent, C.Y. Leung. And so in 2018, a, a really a, a tragic case occurred. There was a, a young Hong Kong couple. They went on a romantic getaway to, to Taipei on the Valentine's Day weekend in 2018. And they quarreled while, that, while they were there. And sadly, the, the, the young woman was murdered by, by her boyfriend. And her boyfriend disposed of the body and then flew back to Hong Kong before anyone knew that anything had gone wrong. Now, eventually, the authorities in, in Hong Kong and in Taipei discovered that the girl had been murdered, and eventually the, the young man confessed to the murder of, of his girlfriend, allegedly, to police, and they found the body. But this case presented a, a problem for the authorities because there is no 
extradition agreement between Hong Kong and Taiwan. So there was no formal mechanism for Taiwan to request the extradition of his name's Chan Tong Kai of Chan to Taiwan for trial. And Hong Kong law does not allow someone to be tried for murder uh, in Hong Kong for a murder that happened outside of Hong Kong. And so there was a, a risk potentially that the that, that justice would never be served for the poor young woman, Pan Hui Wing was her name, who was tragically murdered and, and her family would never see justice for, for, for her murder. And so the Hong Kong government wanted to figure out a way to address this injustice. Now, there are a number of possible mechanisms that, that could have been used, including agreeing to an, an ad hoc a sort of one-off extradition arrangement for this particular case. But it seems that Carrie Lam and the Hong Kong government, possibly encouraged by the authorities in Beijing, and in particular, the, the Central Commission for Disciplinary Inspection in, in China, who uh, had long chafed at the idea that fugitive corrupt officials and business people from the mainland could take shelter in Hong Kong, and there was no way for the mainland authorities legally to, to get them. Although, of course, we'd seen some examples of some extrajudicial renditions from Hong Kong back to the mainland. So the, the solution that, that, that Carrie Lam hit upon, which she felt would both solve the immediate problem of the, of the Chan Tung Kai case and would also please her political masters in Beijing, would be to amend Hong Kong's law on extraditions that would remove the, the geographical restriction. So previously, you could only extradite someone from Hong Kong to a, to a place where Hong Kong had, a, had an existing extradition agreement with, and that didn't include either the mainland or Taiwan. And so they, would, they proposed that they would amend the law and remove that restriction so that you could extradite someone from Hong Kong to any country in the world, including Taiwan and including the mainland, provided that some simple procedural hurdles were met. And so this was, was Carrie Lam's proposal and her government put it to the, the legislature. And it, it, it soon confronted something of a backlash in Hong Kong amongst not only Hong Kong's traditional opposition camp, the pan-democrats and, and, and various activists, but also among the business community who became very concerned that they might find themselves subject to extradition requests to mainland China for business dealings gone wrong or for uh, uh, entanglements with local governments that had gone wrong. And so the business community was very concerned uh, and the broader Hong Kong community was very concerned not only at the, the risk of extradition, but just at the prospect of the the, the legal firewall that had previously been in place between Hong Kong and the mainland and the separate legal systems and the separate court systems being somewhat broken down. And so this led to a, a public backlash, which which grew into a, a, a protest movement. There were, there were a number of smaller protests against the extradition bill. Then as the extradition bill, the time approached for the extradition bill to be considered by the Hong Kong's Legislative Council. And everyone knowing that the pro-Beijing parties had a majority on that legislature, so they would be able to push the law through if they wanted to. The, the Sunday before that debate was due to happen in the legislature, a million people took to the streets in Hong Kong and, and marched, and that was on the Sunday, the, the 9th of June. A million people, all dressed in, in white, the traditional Chinese color of mourning, marched against the, against the bill. It, it, was, it was a huge protest march, bigger even than the protest march that stopped the so-called Article 23 um, national security legislation back in 2003. And in the face of this huge protest march, this unprecedented outpouring of community sentiment and, and emotion and political opposition, the government's response was quite um, jaw-droppingly tone deaf. The, the government basically said, we note the community concern. It's great to see people exercising their freedom of assembly and freedom of speech. And we're just going to go ahead with this anyway. Effectively, a, yeah. a, a lamb to city drop dead, echoing a, a famous mm -hmm. uh, headline from New York. So it was, it was really a, a pretty insulting response to 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 such a huge proportion of the population and, and people were were angry and dismayed and so a few days later on the the wednesday the 12th of june when the legislature was due to meet to debate the the bill begin debating the bill Again, tens of thousands of protesters descended on Admiralty, where the Legislative Council building is, blockaded the building, and effectively stopped the meeting from going ahead. 
that was the first day of, of violent confrontations between protesters and police. Police used a very large amount of, of tear gas as well, as well as other non-lethal weaponry to disperse the crowds on that day. But the protesters were successful in stopping the Legislative Council meeting and stopping the, the debate of the bill going ahead. And then a few days later, on the, the subsequent Sunday, the, the 16th of June, so exactly a, a year ago today, as we're speaking here today, an even bigger protest march occurred. This time, people, the estimate is 2 million people. Now, there's sort of no need to, to sort of worry too much about whether that precise number is accurate or not. The point is just that it was it was huge, and it was even bigger than the previous week. And that's uh, you the know. percentage of the 8 million <laughs> living right. in Hong Kong, yeah. it's, it sort of boggles the mind. Absolutely. And, and, you know, it's close to, you know, I mean, a, a quarter of the population, but uh, you know, that's of the people that could actually get out and march. And I'd spoke to many people who, for various reasons, didn't go out and march. So I think you can almost assume that it had the backing of the entire community, this this protest march. Uh, again, a, a, a huge historic protest march, everyone this time dressed in, back, in black, the, the, the Western color of mourning. And this time they were protesting not just the extradition bill, but also the actions of the police on that Wednesday. The, the police had used used tear gas and other offensive weaponry to disperse the crowds. And, the, and the, subsequently, the police chief had suggested that the protest on the Wednesday was a riot. And a riot in Hong Kong or rioting in Hong Kong is a serious criminal charge carrying up to up to 10 years jail. So people were already on the Sunday of that Sunday the, of the second big march demanding that this this characterization of the, of the protest as a riot be dropped and that there be some amnesty for protesters that had already been arrested and of course that the extradition bill be withdrawn now after this very large protest march Carrie Lam said that the work on the bill was suspended it took several months before she formally withdrew the bill from consideration from the legislative process formally, but she effectively announced that you know, for all practical purposes, the bill would, would not be going ahead in its current form. They would be going back to the drawing board and so on. But really, the, the genie was already out of the bottle. And that was the beginning of what became a seven-month protest movement that lasted all the way till uh, till the end of November, with protests happening at least every weekend, sometimes more frequently than that, and protests happening all over Hong Kong. One of the things I'd like for you to expand on is the sort of emotional hue of the protests. We talked earlier in the conversation about how the Umbrella Movement was really this like optimistic view of what the future of Hong Kong could be. But when, it, when we come to 2019, you have quotes of people saying, feeling like they're fighting for the very life of the city. Hmm. So how does that sort of sense of desperation, the, the, the lack of responsiveness from, from the government to the people's demands, end up shaping the, the, the subsequent few months uh, after, after mid-June? Yes. I mean, that was a, a very clear difference in tone between the two movements. The Umbrella Movement was a... A utopian movement at its core. It was trying to improve the the governance of Hong Kong. It was agitating for a a more perfect democracy. It was it was led by you know arguably idealistic students who were who were pushing for this reform and and the expressions of art and culture around the movement similarly carried an optimistic tone. Even the occupied sites themselves were very colourful. You had colourful tents and artwork and and often various cultural events and and you know speeches and movie screenings and performances and things happening there. So it was a it was a very colourful and, and optimistic movement. Now contrast that to 2019, the cause itself from the beginning had a much darker tone. People weren't protesting to try and get something better. They were protesting to try and stop something that they saw as undermining their values, threatening their their safety and security. Yeah. And so that from the beginning had a had a had a darker tone. It was about more fundamental concerns, more existential concerns. Will the Hong Kong and the rights and freedoms that we've come to to value here be able to continue in its current form? And then as the protests continued and uh, the police violence continued and, and clashes between protesters and and police intensified the 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 protests themselves took on a darker tone the just as a visual spectacle the protests were very dystopian 
protesters sure. in their in their gear, and I'm sure the, the the imagery of these protesters with their their black block gear and their hard hats and their gas masks and you know all fully equipped is is it's it's a it's a something like something out of his dystopian film in a way. Yeah. And so there was this this dark overtone to to the protests and, and all of the 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 cultural iconography that that went with it. And, and then speaking to the protesters, as you alluded to, they they were talking about this sense of. Uh, this being their last chance to protest and to, the last chance to stand up for the Hong Kong that they wanted because they felt that if they lost this battle, and in particular as the protests wore on and became more intense and lasted for longer, they said, if we do all this and the government doesn't listen to us, then then there's no hope left. And that eventually fed through to the sentiments being expressed by some protesters of being willing to die for the cause of, of them you know, going into protests with their last will and testaments packed in their backpacks and, and these sorts of things. So it was a much, a much darker and much more desperate protest movement as a result. I think we shouldn't sort of overplay the, 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 the comparisons between, between the Black Lives Matter protests in, in, in Hong Kong, but I think there's, there's a real interesting contrast here in that fundamentally the American protesters still have some hope. And there's a parallel in that also five years ago, there were Ferguson protests all around the country and people feel like nothing's happened and, and, and no one and no one listened to the to the demands. But it, it's it's really fascinating. ta Coates, who in the past has been sort of as negative about the future of American race relations as they come, gave an interview talking about how he really does feel like this could be a different moment and, and how things could change. And so there there is a there is a sense of, of, of folks being fed up, but also a sense that this the momentum is so big that you even see Mitch McConnell trying to put through some sort of legislation to address the 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 issues and it, and it seems like almost everyone from Republican and Democrats re- recognize that, that that there's a problem here with the exception of course of the president of the United States. Mm-hmm. So, you know, given that it must I'm just trying to, to 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 get myself in the heads of a 19-year-old Hong Konger um seeing no response whatsoever after mm-hmm. bringing out a quarter of the population after spending you know, weekend after weekend, trying to make their voice heard. And it, and it really comes down to the nature of the governments and the nature mm-hmm. of the relationship between between Hong Kong and Beijing, which is that, the, you know, first off, like the fact that Carrie Lam was running the show in the first place, mm-hmm. and then the, the, the lack of wiggle room that, that she was able to, to use once it once it was clear that that this was a really big issue. It, it, it's understandable how it how it feeds into a, a sense of desperation. Yeah, I mean, look, it, absolutely, and, and there, you know, th- what the people of Hong Kong don't have that people in in the US do have, and I and I and I, and I, I say this fully cognizant of the fact that these mechanisms are, are also imperfect in the US, and, and and many people in the US remain voiceless. But you know, Hong Kong does not have the benefit of having a, a democratically elected government, so there's no way that the people, no matter how angry they are with government policy and how much they wish to change government policy, including the, the administration and the, and the policies of the police. Ultimately, there's nothing they can do about it because they can't vote out the government and vote in the leader of their choice. And I think that's something that really does drive the, the desperation of the Hong Kong protest movement. But just to pick up on, on another point you made, I think that the other interesting thing that, that, that at least from my point of view as a, a cultural observer and cultural commentator, is the way that these protest movements have resonated with each other and fed back and forth yeah. into each other and and really both in in 2014 and and in the last 12 months so in 2014 you, you just mentioned the ferguson protests and they occurred just shortly before the umbrella movement kicked off here in hong kong and and i saw in the very first days of the umbrella movement when the protesters the young student protesters were first confronting police they were adopting the the hands up don't shoot gesture that was we had just seen on our television screens from from ferguson a few weeks earlier and so this 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 protest gesture that originated you know, in the US was was immediately replicated on the streets of Hong Kong and then similarly I saw images and reports from the protests in the US over the last few weeks of people using the be water slogan which which was something that the Hong Kong protesters used here last year protesters in in the US using umbrellas in the same way that Hong Kong protesters used umbrellas as a, as a defensive tool and protesters in the US learning how to handle tear gas following the the technology techniques that were developed on the streets of Hong Kong. And so it's really interesting just to see these protest movements feeding back and forth and resonating with each other uh, across the globe. 
So let's get into that. One of the issues with Occupy Wall Street and with the Umbrella Movement is that they were sort of static and in one place. And if you didn't happen to walk down past Zuccotti Park, it was, I guess, sort of on CNN, but it wasn't a constant presence in your, presence in your life. And the government and the, the Hong Kong government, as well as the New York City government and other you know, municipalities around the U.S., once they decided to clear out the protests, you sort of lost all momentum. Um, but as you alluded to, this new idea of, of being water, of having this, quote, open source protest ended up making the the movement much more sustainable and and you know much more visible in the eyes of you know different neighborhoods around Hong Kong go a little bit into how that sort of originated and 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 how it ended up playing out over the summer and fall of 2019 yeah sure so you're quite right that the protesters in 2019 saw the the failings of the umbrella movement and saw that this static fixed occupation simply wasn't successful and it was not sustainable. And so when it came to the beginning of this protest movement last year, when they had these first very large, very successful protests that blocked the exact same streets that were occupied back in 2014, they didn't stay and occupy those streets overnight. At the the end of the night, as the last MTR trains were departing to take everyone home to, to the suburbs at around 1230 at night, everyone left. Yeah. And at, at first, this was kind of puzzling. I, everyone, myself and other observers, said, that's, that's odd. They're not. They're choosing not to occupy in the way that they did five years ago. What's what's happening here? And after only a, a couple of days in, they began to articulate this this new philosophy of protest that they call "Be Water." After a saying popularized by Bruce Lee, the hometown hero, martial arts uh, movie star, um, but he himself got it from 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 Lao Tzu, the, from the the, the Tao Te Ching, the Taoist philosopher. This idea that water is 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 soft; it, it can flow; it moves around very easily but it can also be strong and it can crash and it can erode very solid surfaces over time. And so the protesters adopted this idea of being water, meaning that they didn't try and be fixed in one place, but they would flow around. And if they met resistance from police, rather than try and confront the police, they would flow away. They would go to a particular protest target and they would carry out their protest at that target. And when that protest was successful, they didn't linger. They would then move on to the next target. And so this enabled them to be very mobile, very agile. It made it very difficult for the authorities to contain and to clear them because they would just flow away. And it also meant they were much more sustainable because it didn't require that commitment of sleeping on a concrete road for three months straight. You could turn up, you could go to a protest, you could move around. At the end of the day, you could go home, you could sleep in your own bed and then come back the next day and do it all again. And it also meant that the protests were not fixed in just one location in the city, as, as you alluded to earlier in your question, they spread throughout the city and throughout all of the 18 districts of Hong Kong. And this is something that really made this protest movement different from all of the previous protest movements in Hong Kong. Traditionally, Hong Kong protests had a, a fixed route. Protests would begin in Victoria Park, Park and they would march through Causeway Bay, Wan Chai, Admiralty, and end in Central. And that was sort of the traditional protest march route. But this time, protests took place all over the city, not just on Hong Kong Island, but in Kowloon and the New Territories, in places that traditionally have never seen protests, places like Tun yeah. Mun and Chun Wan and Sha Tin and Chun Kwan O, often you know, far out residential districts or, or, or commercial districts, industrial districts. And this meant that the protesters were, were taking their message out to the communities in a way that the Umbrella Movement signally failed to do. The Umbrella Movement was quite insular in a way, whereas this protest movement spread out throughout the city, engaged the the population, and, and like water, flowed across the whole city. And so it was a fundamentally different philosophy, a completely new approach to protest in Hong Kong, and it proved to be very sustainable and very successful. It's fascinating to think about that, but I think it's important to remember for, you know, anyone thinking that, like, this is the lesson that Black Lives Matter protests should learn in America, is that, like, it shouldn't have, you shouldn't have to have to be water to do protests all around the city and, and, and whatnot. Like the reason this was the case was because these these protesters were threatened with arrest and, you know, years in jail for for organizing in this way. So, you know, it, it, there was a moment maybe 10 days ago where certain American cities, they would start imposing um, curfews and basically saying it was it was sort of illegal to gather in sort of in response to some organized and some organized as well as less organized looting. But it's 
I think this is a this is a relatively positive thing that the sort of organizing methods of using Telegram and having these like cells of ten people um, and everyone being anonymous is not something that that folks have had to move to use in America. <laughs> Yeah, certainly in Hong Kong, there's now a very real prospect of all or many of the 8,000 some people that were arrested in the course of the protests last year facing charges for rioting. And rioting carries up to an up to 10 year jail sentence in Hong Kong. So many of these young protesters, as you say, are facing serious criminal charges and potentially jail time. And so the need to the need to innovate their protest techniques to avoid avoid getting arrested basically is is, is really important. So there were pro, there were legitimate residents of Hong Kong who were pro Beijing. Could you talk a little bit about their sort of demographics and motivations? Yeah, certainly. I mean, look, there, yeah, there, there is absolutely a, a portion of the population that is supportive of of Beijing, of, of the government, of the pro Beijing political parties. What is interesting is the the as the the protests carried on that that. That, and the protests became more extreme and arguably more violent, that the support for the protests and against the protests didn't really change that much. And there were a number of opinion polls conducted by very reputable, objective pollsters, such as by the University of Hong Kong and the Chinese University, that took the temperature of the community. And, and what emerged from those polls was something really, really quite interesting that in terms of the people who were supportive of the protesters and and opposed to the government and, and critical of the government and the police, they tended to be people who were either young, so 18 to 30 years old, not not too surprising, and also people who'd received a, a university education or above. And that is, is, tends to be the, the middle class professional community in Hong Kong. So that was the group that were broadly speaking, in support of the protesters. The people who were broadly speaking in support of the government and the police tended to be either older age demographics, so 60 plus, or people who'd only received a primary school education. And so this tends to be people from the the rural communities in the Northern New Territories, fishing communities, so on, as well as recent immigrants from the mainland. And and of course, the, the elderly and by nature, more conservative members of the community. And of course, the other people in Hong Kong who are very famously pro-Beijing and supportive of the government is the business community. Many of the business community have deep business connections to the mainland and have a great self-interest in, in close relationship between Hong Kong and the mainland and, and, a, and so are supportive of the, of the pro-Beijing parties and the government for that reason. So you sort of end up with this interesting demographic split where on the one side you have, um, and this is going to start sounding familiar to, to listeners in the United States, on the one hand you have the educated professional middle class and young people. And on the other side, you have business tycoons and rural people and elderly people. And it's just the kind of social division that has emerged here that really has emerged in many other places throughout the world. And I I sort of couldn't help thinking that if you took those same survey results and and removed the labels and and said, this is a a, a pro-Trump, anti-Trump survey or a pro-Brexit, anti-Brexit survey, the demographics would end up looking pretty similar, I would would dare say. But what, what was, I think, in a way, most and continues to be most tragic for Hong Kong is that the government really, in a way that, that I, I, I believe hasn't happened as much in, in, in other countries facing similar social divisions, the government really has demonized and made enemies of the people who support the protesters and the protesters themselves. Indeed, Carrie Lam herself has described them as enemies of the people. In fact, she did so today in a press conference. She said anyone who is opposing the national security law is making themselves an enemy of the people. And so the government has made an enemy of an entire generation of its youth and also the 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 engine of a service-led economy, such as Hong Kong, the professional middle class, and it's it's obviously it's it's against the the economic self-interests of Hong Kong, but also it's just a tragedy for a community to for a government to divide its own community in that way and to treat the the best and brightest of the community as enemies, effectively forcing them either to to leave or or, or, or condemning them to a to a lifetime of being marginalised and and feeling undervalued and 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 not not an accepted part of their own society. So it. It's, it's really sure. a tragic act in Hong Kong. So, you know, one of the interesting contrasts is that in Hong Kong, the sort of business leaders, the the domestic, in, the, the beloved domestic institutions like the MTR, had very little wiggle room. You know, it's 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 hard to say that they, you know, were forced into. Well, well some of these institutions certainly were forced into back in the protests, but. You know, the, the elites and the institutions basically came out as pro-government and pro 
and pro Hong Kong protesters. Whereas in the U S you know, we even have Roger Goodell um, of the national football league coming out and saying black lives matter. And, you know, we screwed up, but we're going to try to do better. So this sort of like, not necessarily coalition, but the, but the mix of pro government groups is really, they've sort of lost the right wing elite in the U S in a way that wasn't something that could have possibly happened within Hong Kong. Yes, and these sort of um, demands for loyalty and demands for public expression of support are only growing even stronger now in in recent weeks and months with this new national security law. And it's something that began began back in the umbrella movement, it intensified during the protests of last year, and now uh, really has 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 intensified even more. And so, obviously, some of these entities, such as as the MTR and, and the airport authority and various government departments, they are they are part of the government or owned and controlled by the government. So they, they really yeah. have have no choice. But for for other independent commercial entities, the business realities is what drives them or what is what puts them in this position that they really have no choice. Someone like Cathay Pacific, who derive a huge amount of their, their revenue from flying to and from mainland China, really had no choice but to sack staff people who supported the protests and put out strong statements um, against the protests. Uh, a company like HSBC, when when former chief executive CY Leung called them out a few weeks ago and said, why haven't they expressed support for this national security law? And maybe we should all boycott them since they make so much of their money out of China. Again, as a business reality, they had they had little choice but to make some kind of statement of support as, as, as demanded. And that is becoming, and this is a much broader, broader topic, but that is becoming the, the cost of doing business in, in, in China and, and the cost of doing business in Hong Kong, the political fealty. So I want to come back to the sort of police response. You have this wonderful passage that I want to read in full about your experience of being tear cast over the course of 2019. As well as having a psychological effect of those being gassed, tear gas also has a psychological effect on those deploying it and those looking on, either in person or through the media. By creating a sense of violence and chaos, tear gas works to objectify the crowd, turning it from a group of human beings into a seething, writhing mass. Tear gas also helps turn a protest into a riot and therefore makes it a legitimate target for further state violence. Understanding this perhaps helps to explain why the Hong Kong police deployed so much tear gas on the citizens of the city over the course of 2019. Often when the crowd was not violent, not charging police times, and sometimes even when the streets were totally empty, it helped justify the police's own actions. Organized to deploy force against the people, tear gassing those people turned them from fellow Hong Kong citizens with whom they might sympathize into objectified other, into criminals. The echoes here between some of the, the, the American police tactics really, really struck out to me. Mm. Yeah, I mean, look, the reason why I, I opened the book with this quite detailed chapter on tear gas is that tear gas became such a feature of ordinary everyday life in Hong Kong in the course of the protests last year. We had tear gas fired on the streets of Hong Kong every single weekend but one in the course of seven months. And in every district in Hong Kong, tear gas at some point was fired in the course of those seven months. It was not just something that was the experience of the radical frontline protesters. It was an experience that people, ordinary citizens, people going about their business, people in going shopping, people even in their homes encountered. And and so I wanted to not only just, just make that clear and, and talk about that a bit, but also try to understand why why that happened. Why did the, t- the, the police turn to tear gas as a first resort rather than a last resort? Why, why were they firing tear gas at empty streets? Why were they firing tear gas when people had nowhere to escape to? Firing tear gas inside, inside an MTR subway station, for example. All of these things didn't initially make sense until you start to think about what I describe in that passage, the the purpose of tear gas, its psychological as well as its physiological effects, and what it's intended to do, and not just in the minds of the people being gassed, but in the way that it's deployed and and strategically what it's being intended to do. And, and these are all issues that that, are, that I think are common across the world, wherever, wherever tear gas is used and, and going back through history. Let, let's talk a little bit more about the police. So as you write, they were sort of put in a in a, in a really impossible situation in that the Carrie Lam and the Hong Kong government were treating a fundamentally political problem as a problem of, of, of law and order, which up the which up the game of, of confrontation over and over. I'm hmm. curious what you think made it such that as the sort of as the protests got more more intense, uh, the protesters were able to maintain the support of the population. So, yeah, as as 
you mentioned clearly the the Hong Kong police were put by the government into a position they they never should have been in. That the government weren't engaging directly with the population, weren't responding to the demands of the people, were making, you know, at best a, a weekly press conference appearance at which they would condemn the protesters, condemn the violence and tell everyone to stop without addressing any, any of the underlying issues. And in this environment, the police became the only interface that people had with the government. And that's not a role that police a police force is equipped to handle. Police force, a police force is equipped to handle public order issues and, of course, criminal behaviour, and they have a very limited set of tools with which to deal with that. And so this complex political problem became a law and order crowd management problem and police deployed the only tools they had to handle that, tear gas and truncheons. And that became the way that the government was interfacing with its population. So clearly a a problematic dynamic. And clearly, you know, of course, there were examples where the police overstepped the mark, used excessive force and and many documented examples of that. But also, you know, ultimately, if you ask who, who was to blame for that, the blame lies with the government who put the police into that position in the first place and put them into that sort of frontline position without the tools to, to, to handle the, the actual underlying problem. But to get to your question of what was it that meant the protesters retained public support notwithstanding the, the violent scenes was, was quite simply that for every weekend, invariably the protests occurred on weekend, for every weekend where the protesters did something that, that might have been thought would be something that would cause them to lose public support, such as vandalising stores or vandalising MTR stations or such as breaking into the Legislative Council chamber or, or such as you know, scuffling with, with police and throwing, throwing Molotov cocktails or any of those things. For every time that one of those sorts of incidents happened, invariably the very same weekend, the police, because of the situation to which they were forced, would do something equally, if not more outrageous. The, the, the result of that, the tension was diverted away from the protesters and the outrage was directed towards the police. And, and people, the people are not stupid. People understand and are aware of the power imbalance between police and protesters. People are aware of the reasons why the protesters are there and the emotions that are driving the protesters. And people are aware of the way that a professional police force should behave. And they don't take, they don't, they don't take a simplistic, the simplistic view of these things that the government would, would want them to take. And so because of these dynamics, and because the population sympathise with the underlying cause of the protests as well, of course, the protesters retained their support from the community over the weeks and months of the protests. Yeah. There's there's also another important principle which, which I should mention, and this harks back to the Umbrella Movement as well. As I mentioned earlier, the Umbrella Movement saw a lot of internal dissension among the protest community as to who were the leaders of the protests or what the what direction the protests should take. And, and this echoed really problems among the Hong Kong pan-democrat political parties over many years of them having sort of splits among the parties and feuds and a lot of internal factional disputes that meant they were rarely the united force that the, the, the pro-Beijing DAB political party was. And people learned lessons from, from that finally. And in the protests of last year, they introduced a new principle, the so-called no splitting or no cutting off principle. And and what this principle held was that even if you disagree with an action being taken by another protester or by a group of protesters, you shouldn't criticize them, you shouldn't split from them. You can choose not to participate yourself, but the maintaining the unity of the protest movement was a very important principle. And as I say, this was something that was learned from the bitter experience of, of the umbrella movement and, and the history of, of pan-democrat politics in Hong Kong. And that was the other thing, in addition to the factors I just mentioned, that kept community support behind the protest movement for, for so long and, and at such a sustained level. This idea that we ha- we can't allow ourselves to be separated and, and driven into infighting and internal dissension. If we're going to win, uh, we're going to have to maintain this unity. It just strikes me as so... Like the fact that governments around the world don't understand the basic fact that once you have an initial protest, like the main thing that sustains it is police violence. And, and how sort of like, you know, th- this happened a few times in Hong Kong where like for a week, the Hong Kong police got the message that like, hey, let's like ease off this week and like let, let folks do their thing. And then you sort of saw tensions ratcheting down. And then all of a sudden, you know, after two weeks, the government would give up and say, no, let's like 
get 500 more kids and throw them and throw them in jail. And then the, the sort of frustration of the of the protesters as well as the community would sort of would, would ramp back up. Presumably, it's just psychologically very difficult to sort of cede control of your city to these protesters for a, a certain amount of time. And, and that loss of control is, is something that motivates the police to, you know, in the U.S. and in, and in Hong Kong and all around the world to shockingly frequently meeting these protests with 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 aggression. Mm. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not sure if you saw this phenomenon in the US, but certainly in, in Hong Kong, it was extremely common that uh, it's as simple as, you know, no police, no violence. If, if the police don't turn up, there's no violence, there's no violent reaction from the crowds, they they carry out their protest peacefully and they leave. But the minute that police turn up, and especially in Hong Kong, the policing tactic of of turning up in full riot gear clearly ready for confrontation, which immediately ratchets up the tension, prompts violence. And and indeed, there's been some excellent scholarship, in particular coming out of the UK around this, a gentleman called Clifford Stott and a number of his colleagues have researched public order policing. And one of the, the many great insights that he has is that policing a public order event in that way, turning up in full riot gear, effectively will every time will, will, will cause violence to occur. Whereas if police turn up in their ordinary uniform, not equipped with weapons, but, but in a communicative mode, in a mode of wanting to facilitate the protest to occur safely, that's the best way to avoid violence happening at these protests. And, and I would assume that you have a similar dynamic in the US as well. So my other, my other sort of crackpot theory on this is escalation in the U.S. has a fundamentally different hue because this is an armed society. And we have, you know, lots of guns on the streets and lots of and, and sort of the use of, of deadly force by cops is also a much more a much more common thing. I remember when at some point over the Hong Kong protests, like like a police officer fired their gun and it was like the world was ending, which is something that happens, you know. I don't know, thousands of times in the U.S. every day. So Dave Chappelle, he had a special where he alluded to a handful of times where where veterans actually ended up shooting and killing and killing cops. And I think once you it, like the slope to get to that, which I think is where a lot of people in the U.S. would would, would draw the line is is much faster than hmm. than in a than in a society like Hong Kong, which isn't which isn't armed and doesn't have like a you know just does doesn't 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 sustain the level of violence that it, that that America does. Yeah, no, you're you're quite right. We're entirely different societies. My favorite statistic that just really starkly illustrates that is not only that but the one you just mentioned that we had, I believe, three cases of police discharging their firearms and shooting people in the course of the protest last year, and these were considered shocking events. But in Hong Kong, a, a population of over seven million people in this city, we have had one case of homicide by firearm in something like the last six years. So that's just an example of the, the different cultures that we have. There. You had a wonderful description of the weekly protests as choreographed, performative, and almost balletic. Hmm. Uh, can you could you expand on that, Anthony? Yeah, I mean, what what emerged as these protests happened, as I say, week in week out, every weekend, was this sort of template, this kind of pattern, almost a script. And it seemed like everyone, protesters and police, were playing their part in this script. It almost followed the traditional you know, three-act structure. We had a, a first act where the protesters would turn up and have their, their peaceful protest. And that would end when the, the peaceful protesters met the police lines. And then in the second act, there would be the violent confrontation between the protesters and the police. The, the police would begin to fire tear gas or use their water cannons or fire rubber bullets. And the protesters would respond with, with, with Molotov cocktails or, or bricks or umbrellas. And they'd begin sort of scuffling and skirmishing with the police. And then in the final act, the protesters would be water and disperse in the surrounding streets as the poli- with the police sort of in pursuit, ultimately ending when the police find themselves facing an empty street because all the protesters have have, have disappeared and, and, and been water and, and, and gone. And what we found happening was that, and when I say we, I sort of mean the, the members of the media and reporters on the ground who were, who were covering these protests, is that the same pattern happened every weekend to the extent that it was actually quite predictable. You could, you could follow the script playing out. And so there was this sense that because of that, that the violence was on both sides. And I, I don't want to say, I don't want to... Um, Devaluate. I don't want to say that it was it was it was purely theatre or that it was purely a game, but there was also the sense that that they each had their own objectives and their own defined roles, and they weren't genuinely trying to 
hurt each other. So the protesters, yeah. even though they were throwing Molotov cocktails, they didn't throw them directly at police. They throwed them at the road between the protesters and the police to slow the police advance. So the protesters were aiming to hold territory for as long as possible and to make the, the police job of clearing them as difficult as possible. And the police, while they indeed were carrying out violent arrests and trying to disperse the crowds, also weren't engaging in the the, the, the really violent tactics that, that people, for example, overseas and, and many pro-Beijing or pro-government people sort of speculated they could have done. They weren't, as you say, you know, shooting people all the time. And so there was this sort of sense that there was something curious going on in the roles that, that each of those sides were playing and the way they considered each other and the way that this, this structure and this script sort of played its way out every week. And so that's sort of why I sort of concluded that it, it was almost uh, something, something theatrical about it in the way that it occurred yeah let's talk a little bit about the the sort of beijing interpretation of this and this is something Mm. i I saw and and, and reported on just reading my wechats and conversations about how this was fundamentally an issue of economic frustration and young hong kongers are upset that their rent's too high and they don't have upward mobility and maybe they're kind of just like pissed off because now the mainland folks are richer than they are, which wasn't the dynamic of the second half of the, mm. of most of the second half of the 20th century. Mm. Reading you describe this again, it, it struck me this time as like, it's almost understandable that folks in Beijing and mainlanders would actually earnestly believe that because the sort of Hong Kong values that you describe, where Hong Kongers really derive their identity from having this, as you say, clean, corruption-free government, a lively and unfettered meter, media, the freedom to criticize the government, observance of rule and law and process, an independent judiciary. Like, it's hard to sort of conceptualize how those things can mean so much to people unless you've lived under that system and you live next to a country that doesn't believe in that and you know, you, you, you're facing the end of sorts of political freedom. No, you're, you're quite right. And that's sort of one of two narratives that the, the Beijing and the government has been pushing. The first was that narrative that this is really all about economic opportunity and social mobility and, and housing affordability. Um, and the other was that this is all a foreign plot fermented by foreign forces who are looking to cause trouble for China. And they, they both hold their allure as a simple explanation for what's going on if you're looking for one. And in particular, as you, you, you very perceptively point out, for people who don't have a, a firsthand grasp or understanding of, of the values that people are protesting for. But to undermine those narratives and to, to really destroy those narratives, all you had to do was to go out on the streets, watch the protests and speak to the protesters. And if you do that, uh, firstly, if you ask them, you know, why are you here? Beijing says it's about economic economic opportunity and housing affordability. They'll say, uh, you know, no, it's not. We're here because we want democracy. We're, we're here because we want Hong Kong to be given the autonomy that it was promised. And, you know, not once in seven months of protest did anyone chant on the streets, I want affordable housing or I want you know, a better job. They were talking about democracy. And if you ask them why they were there, they'll tell you very directly. And then as for the the, the foreign forces thing, I mean, firstly, it's it's insulting to the intelligence of the Hong Kong people that the that that Beijing seems to think they're not capable of of organizing themselves or, you know, doing things as simple as sort of, you know, buying some hard hats and face masks and 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 you know, teaching themselves how to sort of be organized. But also it, I just it's, think it, it's so funny. It's like it's like the CIA is not that good. Like right. they, they could not get twenty five percent of any city in the world out on the streets. Like exactly. you figure out Iraq and Afghanistan, you're really gonna Exactly, exactly. And look going out on the streets week in, week out, you you see the organic nature of this movement. You you see the people, um, and also you see the tactics and the and the, the the techniques developing week by week, and you see people learning. Uh, the protest movement becomes this sort of organic entity, and you see it learning and evolving and developing over time. It's not something that is externally given to them, you know, trained or sort of, you know, t- they're not following instructions. You can watch and observe these, the, the sign language they developed or the techniques they use for putting out tear gas or the techniques they use to sort of organize themselves and, and disperse. And these sort of you, you, you could watch that developing over time in a very organic way that, that so clearly wasn't an artificial externally imposed or externally you know, g- given or trained technique. So yeah, I mean, all, all of these narratives, as I say, they're very convenient 
for Beijing. They they play well for propaganda purposes, and they they they're easy to understand. But they're ultimately they're ultimately not they have no foundation. And, and anyone who spent time on the streets can can see that pretty quickly. The other thing that struck out to me is like. People forget that there are protests in mainland China, but studies on them show that almost all of them are economically motivated and people are, you know, clamoring for their land not to be appropriated or for less pollution in their neighborhood or, you know, or, or, or better, you know, better economic opportunities. So the, the way that sort of maps onto how folks, you know, how, how government officials and how you know, mainland people interpreted interpreted Hong Kong makes makes some sense. But yeah, anyway, really... we are on the Lawfare Network, Anthony. So I mm. think it um, certainly behooves us to talk about how the Hong Kong government weapon, weaponized, at least, you know, before June of 2020, a you know common law system to wage war on the protesters. So before we get into the national security law, talk a little bit about the tactics that were used to rein in and punish the protesters. Certainly. So, yeah, lawfare is a term that I've borrowed and applied here in Hong Kong because it describes the way that the Hong Kong government, encouraged by Beijing, have used Hong Kong's legal system as a tool to to target dissent and to target political opponents. Now, I should say at the outset, this is a very clever strategy because rule of law is is widely recognised as one of Hong Kong's key assets. It's, it's one of its core values that people uh, from the, the pandemic camp themselves talk about as being something that's very important to Hong Kong. It's something that the international community, and in particular the international business community, talk about as being one of the key factors that makes Hong Kong an attractive place to do business and makes it different from the rest of China. So the government can point to the rule of law and say, hey, this is something that everyone agrees upon. It's a, it's a, a universally accepted good. And so when they then use the rule of law or use the legal system in a targeted way to target dissent and target pa- target political opponents, they can rely upon this this excuse that, well, we're, all we're doing is enforcing the law. This is the rule of law. This is what, you, you know, you guys in the international community are always telling us is so important. Well, all we're doing is is doing that. But of course, they're, they're doing it not at all in, in an objective, even-handed way. They're doing it in a very targeted way, specifically to try and shut down dissent. And it so happens that Hong Kong has, in its legal system, some fairly uh, repressive tools that are the remnants of the old colonial legal regime, laws that were put in place going as far back as the 1920s to counter a a large strike of of waterfront workers that occurred then, and back to the 1960s when some laws were put in place to deal with the Cultural Revolution era riots that engulfed Hong Kong in 1967. And those laws remained on the books, remained on the books after the handover, and are now being turned to by the Hong Kong government to target the protesters now and in recent years. One of those laws that's that's really uh, particularly um, egregious is that that rioting law that I mentioned earlier. That's in what's called the Public Order Ordinance. The Public Order Ordinance basically says that any assembly of people in the streets of Hong Kong needs the permission of the Commissioner of Police to go ahead. And if a large public uh, gathering or protest march happens without that consent, it's an unlawful assembly. So that automatically is illegal. And anyone taking part in that unlawful assembly is subject to criminal charges. Now, where that unlawful assembly results or involves a breach of the peace, and those are the exact words, and you think for yourself how you want to define breach of the peace, but that is then called a riot, and you could be subject to up to 10 years jail for that. And so the the police and the prosecutors here use the, the the provisions of the public order ordinance to arrest anyone involved in these protests and to lay charges on them. And what is interesting is that the the, the use of prosecutorial discretion, the, the decisions of the prosecutors as to who they're going to charge, what they're going to charge them with, and what sentences they're going to ask for, have been consistently exercised against the protesters to the harshest extent. So whereas you often have prosecutors in more sensible times or in more sensible jurisdictions saying, well, the, this is a, a marginal case, there's, uh, you know, or this person you know, has a good record and doesn't deserve to be charged, or if we do charge them, we'll charge them with a lesser offence and we won't pursue a, a custodial sentence, for example, you know, in the interests of the administration of justice and often in the interests of, of simply efficient allocation of resources. You know, prosecutions cost 
cost money and cost time, both for the prosecutors themselves and for the court system. And prosecutors generally don't spend those resources on marginal or minor cases. But that's not what's happening in Hong Kong. The prosecutors are charging all of the cases with the full force of the law and demanding the harshest possible penalties and harshest possible sentences. And so they are doing this in a way, in a very targeted way. So pro-democracy, anti-government protesters get this kind of treatment, whereas people who are involved in protests on the pro-government side or involved from the pro-government side in scuffles with anti-government protesters are usually not arrested. If they're arrested, they're not charged. And if they are charged, they generally receive fairly lenient treatment from the prosecutors and the courts. And so this is just the one of the ways in which this, this lawfare is being conducted. And it goes, it goes beyond that. It goes all the way back to the elections of, of 2016, the government using various provisions in the electoral laws to disqualify candidates from running for office. They decided that any candidate whose party platform referred to self-determination or autonomy for Hong Kong was by definition breaching the basic law because the basic law says that you know, Hong Kong is a part of China under one country, two systems, and therefore none of those candidates was allowed to stand for office and they were all disqualified from standing for office. And then, of course, we had the, the oath-swearing controversy I mentioned earlier. So th- those are just some of the ways that the legal system has been used again and again over in recent years by the government to, to, to crack down on dissent and to target their political opponents. Yeah, there was a very dramatic cover of the South China Morning Post recently, uh, sort of representing all of the folks who are facing hmm. uh, legal action as a result of their involvement with the protest, which was really a striking thing for them to do. Yes. I mean, look, there have been more than 8,000 people arrested in the course of the last year of protests. Some of those have faced trial already. Some are yet to face trial as some, I think the, the, the status of their cases remains open as to whether the police will charge them or not. But we've already seen some trials go through and we've seen um, a young protester who was involved in scuffle with the police on the 12th of June last year be sentenced to four years jail uh, for rioting. We just heard uh, uh, a few days ago that the key protesters who were arrested for, in connection with the break-in to the Legislative Ch- Council chamber on the 1st of July last year will also be charged with rioting. And what's interesting is when you set these cases alongside the cases of pro-government or pro-Beijing agitators, and one that really stood out was a couple of months, a month or so ago, a, a pro-Beijing agitator went to a Lenin wall, which is one of these sites where where pro-protester art workers was posted in the suburbs, went there with some knives, you know, on a premeditated attack and, and attacked several protesters there with 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 in a knife attack and, and injured three of them, sent three of them to hospital, one of them in critical condition. The judge in that case really made quite sympathetic comments, saying that this man himself was a was a victim of the protests, his business had been adversely affected by the protests, and really painted him, the attacker, as a victim. Now, people in the pro-democracy community were, were outraged both at the, the judge's comments, but also at the, where they couldn't help noticing the, the, the charges and the sentencing. So he was charged with wounding, whereas another protester who stabbed a police officer was charged with attempted murder. So a much more serious charge. And the, the man who had, had stabbed three people, one of them critically, received only a 45-month jail sentence, whereas the, the protester charged with rioting, who had thrown a, a hard hat and a, a traffic cone at police, received a 48-month jail sentence, so a higher jail sentence for rioting than for stabbing three people in a premeditated knife attack. So these sorts of decisions just don't make sense and clearly justice is not being done but the hong kong government makes sense well (laughs) from the point of the government they do make sense but 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 to an objective observer they they don't make sense and and judge justice is not being seen to be done and and so this sort of leads to the conclusion that the, the legal system is being manipulated um in this way and yet the government can say look we're just applying these law these people have committed crimes and we're prosecuting them and and sending them to jail in accordance with the law but it's clearly a a, a very twisted version of the rule of law that's being applied and the fiction really dies with the national security law why don't you walk us through what beijing is proposing to do? right so uh, By way of background, there's a provision in the basic law, that's Hong Kong's constitution, called Article 23, and that provision provides that the Hong Kong legislature should pass laws criminalizing treason, sedition, subversion, and and other national security offenses. As I mentioned earlier, back in 2003, the, the government proposed to 
introduced such laws that people marched on the streets, some half a million people, and, and the government withdrew that law. And it's really been a, a political hot potato ever since, and they haven't tried to reintroduce it. So in the, the course of the, the protests last year, it seems that Beijing felt even more acutely the need for a national security law to be introduced into Hong Kong. And so what they announced a few weeks ago was not that the Hong Kong legislature would go ahead and, and, and draft that law and, and enact it in Hong Kong, as is the process for every other law in Hong Kong, but that the National People's Congress in Beijing will themselves draft the law for Hong Kong and impose it by fiat in Hong Kong over the heads of Hong Kong's legislature. It was a real, a real bombshell of a development and really quite astounding that Beijing is, is, is undermining Hong Kong's legislature, undermining the entire constitutional order of Hong Kong to, to do this. Now, there is a provision in the basic law that allows Beijing to legislate for Hong Kong on matters of defense and foreign affairs. And they are arguing that this is something that is beyond the scope of Hong Kong's autonomy and something they have the power to do. The, the Bar Association here in Hong Kong begs to differ. And they've said they don't think that Beijing has the constitutional power to do this. But it doesn't matter much because ultimately Hong Kong's constitution means whatever Beijing says it means. And Beijing has the power to interpret or reinterpret it accordingly. Now, we haven't seen yet the draft of this national security law or exactly what it will contain. But already, Beijing spokespeople and Hong Kong government spokespeople are talking about the kind of things that it might do. And they're, they sound concerning. A couple of things that in particular are concerning is that the uh, decision of the NPC that authorized the drafting of this law also said that mainland national level national security organs will be allowed to establish a presence in Hong Kong and operate in Hong Kong and will partake in, in, in implementing national security laws in Hong Kong. So effectively, that is bringing into Hong Kong for the first time the mainland secret police, the, the Ministry of Public Security, who will be allowed to operate um, on the ground here in Hong Kong. The other areas of concern include a recent statement by one of the vice chairs of the Hong Kong Macau Affairs Office, who said that in some extreme cases, Beijing may have jurisdiction themselves over some serious national security cases. So taking the case entirely out of the hands of the Hong Kong judicial system. Also some comments by the Secretary for Justice this week that people shouldn't expect the mainland drafted national security law to to follow Hong Kong common law. So there's so many different ways in which the Hong Kong court system, the Hong Kong rule of law, Hong Kong's autonomy from Beijing is being undermined by this latest development. And really, as I say, we're going to have to wait and see exactly what the law says when the draft emerges, but it doesn't bode well for Hong Kong's autonomy. And it also just adds another tool in the toolbox for both Hong Kong and Beijing governments to continue to pro prosecute their campaign of lawfare. Let's talk a little bit about the, the, the legacy of 2019. You write that the protest built a uh, revolutionary people. And this, this is like a liminal experience for high schoolers and college kids. But I want to apologize to my listeners, I guess, for these past few episodes and, you know, over the past few years for having been so U.S. focused. So I have two international analogies to make here. The first is Poland. In the, in the 19th and 20th centuries, you know, the lack of autonomy once Catherine the Great wiped it off the map and over the course of, you know, the 20th century as well, where there was only a few decades where Poland had, had true independence. But these sorts of, you know, occasional protests and rebellions were able to keep the flame of, of an independent Poland alive and keep that dream and that culture going through, you know, centuries of, of not, having, not having political autonomy. And there's the same narrative that can be told, of course, for the, for the history of Ireland. But as you write, Anthony, there's also a, a, a fear that this could turn into, that, that, that Hong Kong could turn into something looking like 20th century Belfast, which is also not a particularly optimistic take. So on the one hand, it, it, you write about this, and it looks to me like there, there, there is something incredibly beautiful and noble about these young people and the, and the whole city really making making a claim and and imprinting this on 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 their memories that these sorts of values that this protest stood for is something that matters and something that they're not gonna forget anytime soon but on the other hand you know you just talked about the uh, the national security law and there really seems to be nowhere out and no optimistic pass forward at least you know with the with the Xi regime in, in power. So what's your take on, on, 
on, on where all of this leaves Hong Kong. That's a great, it's some great observations. The Poland point's particularly interesting. So underlying not only the most recent protest movement, but I would argue the the entire recent history of political protest in Hong Kong has been, you know, this idea of Hong Kong identity and, and ultimately the anxiety over Beijing's influence in Hong Kong. And as the protests went on last year, there was this very strong sense of a, firstly, a unique Hong Kong identity, but developing, I think, even further into this idea of a Hong Kong nation. Now, I want to be very clear here to draw a distinction between nation and state. So the Hong Kong people on the whole are not asking for independence. We're not talking about an independent Hong Kong state, but we're talking about the idea of a a nation within a state or what um, some political scientists call stateless nations. But if you think of other stateless nations such as the Catalans in Spain or the Quebecois in Canada or the the Kurds in in Turkey and Iraq. There are these people who are a distinct people with a distinct cultural identity who don't have a state of their own but exist within a a larger state. And the, the course of the protest last year, I think, really helped to solidify and develop this idea of the of the Hong Kong nation as a distinct cultural entity. And so much of what went on around the protests last year was the beginnings of nation building, whether that is through cultural iconography, whether that's through the singing of, of a national anthem. They developed this song, The Gl- Glory to Hong Kong, which was sung as a national anthem. And through the creation of myths and, and legends as sort of national stories, tales of the protesters and what the protesters endured and the, the fate of what they called martyrs in, in the course of the protests. All of these things tied together with the broader protest movement have developed and I think solidified this idea of a of a of a, a of a Hong Kong nation. And again, I'm being just very clear to emphasize not an independent Hong Kong state, but a Hong Kong nation, a Hong Kong identity. And so now we come to this year where um, Beijing has decided to crack down and impose this national security law and try and put a stop to this. But the reaction that we've seen from Hong Kongers uh, seems to be to even further drive them towards this idea of Hong Kong nationhood. And indeed, it seems to be pushing people in some cases towards the more extreme idea of Hong Kong independence. And the way that I sort of have tracked this in particular is by listening to protest slogans. You understand a lot about the progress of a political movement, a protest movement, and what they're demanding and what they're thinking through the slogans they use. Just look at the words that they use. The protest movement in Hong Kong began last year with the slogan, Hong Kong Yen Gaya, or Hong Kong is at oil, this sort of rallying cry that, that from the very beginning was appealing to a certain idea of identity. After the government tried to suppress the movement by banning face masks, that slogan became Hong Kong Yen Fan Hong, Hong Kongers rebel, Hong Kongers resist. After a protester fell to his death tragically, and then another protester was shot by police in in early November, that slogan became Hong Kong Yen Bao Tao, Hong Kongers Revenge. And then in the last recent weeks since the national security law was announced by Beijing, that slogan has become Hong Kong Yen Kin Guok, Hong Kongers Nation Build. And that is but one of a number of pro-independence or pro-autonomy or, or, or slogans that that suggest that this sentiment of of nation building is is continuing and being fed by Beijing's repression. And it sort of leads back to this really, this, you know, in a way, is very tragic point that if if Beijing just stepped back and let Hong Kong have the space that it wanted, none of this would be happening. Uh, you know, Beijing would not have to be contending with proto-independence movement. Beijing would not have to be contending with what they regard as risks to their national security because the Hong Kong people would be quite happy. Hong Kong would be would be prosperous and stable in the way that the Hong Kong government and businesses want it to be. And the people would be content and, and not worried about their futures and not thinking about emigrating or fleeing. And all that would take would be for, for Beijing to step back and give them the autonomy that they're asking for. But in the absence of that, and in the face of the continued crackdown that we're seeing, I don't 
see necessarily the Hong Kong people, you know, just giving up on this yeah. in the same way yeah. that after the umbrella movement, everyone left and went home at the end of 2014 and everything was, was quiet for a few years, but that didn't mean that everyone had abandoned their aspirations. And so even if we do see less violent protest in the course of this year or no immediate pushback to what's happening, it doesn't mean that those tensions are not continuing to bubble away in the background and will emerge and have their expression at some point in the future. Yeah, I mean, it's on, on the one hand, you know, it doesn't take the fall of the Communist Party to to, to have this dynamic change. You know, hmm. there, there are plenty of past past Chinese leaders who have saw that Hong Kong being this having a free press being this being this as you as you write exhaust valve for the, the Chinese for, for, you know, Chinese society is is useful and actually beneficial both to the party and to you know, the mainland more broadly. But on the other hand, it's it's almost it, it's the sort of thing where like once you break it, it's hard to to, to build it back. If you hmm. once you have a national security law, like if you repeal it, will people then be comfortable saying things they used to say? I mean, it, it, it's on the one hand, I, I, I'm hopeful that this sort of spirit is not going to die any soon and this aspiration is not going to die anytime soon. But the, the amount of lasting damage that this line has caused and potentially can cause, you know, can continue to cause is, is really, is really dramatic. Yeah. And you're quite right that you alluded to just now that the, the, the loss of Hong Kong as it is, is not just a loss to the Hong Kong people, but it's a loss to the rest of China and to the rest of the world, this unique role that, that Hong Kong plays. And I, I, I also agree that to a certain extent, once it's once it's broken, it may take a long time to fix it again. But I also am not I'm not convinced that it's going to be broken so easily. I guess that's 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 my hope. And when, when I sort of am asked to sort of sort of i guess to suggest and you know to i guess to you know to, to end on the obligatory note of hope as as sort of the saying goes but you know what is the the hope for hong kong or the optimism for hong kong it really is the hong kong people themselves and and having seen them on the streets and and seen them and their determination and their courage and their conviction it's it's very it's very moving and and it gives me a great deal of of confidence in in hong kong's future with the people that that, that we have here